if you're watching this channel, you probably have a whole lot. You probably know a heck of a lot more about health, for example, than most doctors, at least cardiovascular health. That's something to be grateful for. Today, we're gonna be talking about inflammation. And yes, inflammation is the bigger cause of heart disease, not cholesterol. Anybody recognize these two faces here? I would not have recognized that face from some of the pictures I've seen. Many people have said he looks somewhat like David Wright. Dr. Wright has appeared on the show with us. He's a really good doc in this cardiovascular prevention space. If you've seen the series Charité, it's about a hospital built near Berlin, one of the Kaisers, I don't, I don't remember which one, during the plague. And Charité has gone on to be that one hospital has won more Nobel Prizes in medicine than any other hospital in the world. It's done a great job. One of the more productive time periods was that time period when Rudolf Virchow was there. Virchow is credited as being the father of modern pathology, and he was chief of staff for a while. He said at one point during his activities, he said, you know, I've looked at microscopes were just coming into common use and they were discovering all kinds of things. They were also discovering a lot of things about bacteria, which makes sense if you now have a microscope and you didn't have one before. So one of the things he was looking at was he looked at the arteries of people that were having heart attacks. And he said, these arteries are not only full of plaque, they're full of inflammation. They've got all these immune cells. They're releasing all of this liquid. I think heart attack and stroke is really an inflammation process. This was 150 years ago. What happened? We went down the wrong path in a big way. We got focused on that cholesterol, the plaque, the LDL, we made assumptions and guess what? We're still doing that, aren't we? So if we would just stop, just look, just listen, just study a little bit more, it, which brings up the picture on the right. That is Paul Ridker. He's at Harvard. Those of us who were at Hopkins like to refer to Harvard as the Hopkins of the North. Pardon the competitive jibe there. So Paul Ridker has been the probably one of the biggest mavens for cardiovascular inflammation. He noticed in the what's called the Waskopf study, west of Scotland, I can't remember what the other OP means, W-O-S-C-O-P, and the W-O-S stands for west of Scotland. It was an epidemiological study that were looking at heart attacks. And one of the things he and Gavin Blake, Gavin is one of his colleagues in this space, and it may not have been Blake, but it was Gavin something. They said something that we're all still quoting. If you have LDL elevated or if you have LDL in a normal level, that doesn't seem to make a difference. The people that are having heart attacks seem to have the same levels of LDL that the people that aren't having heart attacks. And then they said, you know what? Maybe this is inflammation. And then they went on to do a couple of other trials like the Jupiter trial. If you go back and look at the Jupiter trial, and yes, you'll get debate on both sides of the issue, but really the Jupiter trial did start to make inroads into this perspective that, and statin haters, just close your ears for a minute. What they saw was whether somebody's LDL was going up, going down, high or low, if they were taking a statin, they tended to have fewer heart attacks. So they said, you know what? We do think statins are doing something here, but it doesn't appear to be coming from LDL levels. There's gotta be something else going on. And maybe it's inflammation because they were focused on this cardiovascular inflammation thing that Virchow had brought up at that point, 130 years prior to that. Sure enough, the Jupiter ending study did begin to indicate that. You fast forward and we'll talk about a study just a couple of years ago called Cantos that caught the cardiology community around the world by surprise. You hear them say over and over again, wait a minute. I knew sort of theoretically that inflammation had something to do with it, but I didn't know that it had that much to do with it. So let me go back to the script here. For over a century, people have focused on LDL as being the cause of heart attacks and stroke. Familial hypercholesterolemia, FH. It helps us understand the relative importance of LDL among cardiovascular risk factors. You remember, I've got a lot of FH patients if LDL were really the biggest issue and other things were not, 
we would know exactly how many people have LDL. We'd have screening programs that are out and active for LDL because we would know that's what's causing heart attacks and strokes. Well, we don't. I diagnosed a lot of people with LDL, but it's still like, we don't know whether it's one in 200 people or one in 500 people. It's just, there's so little that we know about FH. The risk for FH patients is more of a decreased capacity to manage the other risks like smoking or prediabetes. And if you don't believe that, go back and look at some of my videos. Sue was one of the ladies that gave us a great video. She had to have a bypass, quintuple bypass at age 35, 36. She had FH, but her problem was she had FH and she was a smoker. That activity got her to back off and stop the smoking. Then she started developing another problem. She did fine up until her 60s and then she got nervous. She started overeating. She more than doubled her weight. She more than doubled her weight. Guess what happened to her insulin resistance? Guess what happens to all of our insulin resistance when we increase our body fat? She ended up going back again, having to have more surgery. That got her back on the path. She lost half of her body weight. She's now in her 70s, very happy, very comfortable that she knows what she needs to do. Despite having her FH, she knows that I've got FH, I've got a significant increase in LDL, I've got a little bit less resistance than other folks to things like smoking and prediabetes, diabetes associated with weight. So I have to watch my risk factors. But she also knows FH is not going to kill her in her 50s. I've got at least 100 patients with FH. And that's what you see. You see as they start developing other risk factors, they have less resilience. So let's go back to the script again. Pardon me for all these bunny trails. A newer data from the 1990s began to showcase inflammation instead of LDL. Many researchers like Burke and Liuzzo strongly associated inflammation with future cardiovascular events, independent of the usual risk factors. Now here we talk about Paul Ridker, the fellow over in the picture that I mentioned. Paul Ridker and his associates showed elevated CRP levels in healthy subjects before first ever vascular events. And here's the article. That looks like New England Journal. I don't, it's not listed in there, but I'm pretty sure that is. That's one of his New England Journal articles about inflammation, aspirin, and the risk of cardiovascular disease in apparently healthy men. So inflammation starts with an injured intima. You remember what the intima is? It's that lining of the artery wall. If you look over here, that's a drawing of the intima. If you look here, this little piece right here is the intima. If you look on this image, it's a single cell layer thick. It's got a, a hairy projections on the inside called glycocalyx, and it's easily injured especially from things like having blood glucose too high or insulin levels too high. What happens is you get inflammation, that's a darkening area, you get a little bit of bleeding into there. And if these dark areas, that's from the inflammation, it's where the immune system is attacking the plaque. And if those areas get close to the surface and they break through, they can cause a clot. Hot plaque is liquid, when it touches the blood, it can cause a clot. That's what this black thing is. This patient died from a heart attack. And this is only part of the clot. The bigger part of the clot is what killed this patient. It broke off and went in and uh, stopped blood supply to a major portion of the heart. So oxidized LDL particles are trapped in the intimate media space. LDL, remember? So that's why we went down that bunny hole that 100-year bunny hole of thinking it was LDL. Plaque attracts the attention of immune cells. Immune cells release enzymes like LPPLA2, myeloperoxidase. You see here, these are macrocytes, monocytes. They're a type of immune cell. They come in, they find that there's too much plaque. They come in, they start releasing what we call cytokines. The macrocytes turn into foam cells. They start releasing plaque too. It's an enzyme which creates some of this liquefaction, easy for me to say, huh? A liquefaction of the plaque. And once you get that liquefied hot plaque, that's where you get into a problem. MPO, myeloperoxidase, is the same kind of thing, except it's from a different immune cell. It's from a, what we call a neutrophil or a leukocyte or a polymorph. You know, we got way too many names for these things and it just continues to make it more complicated.
Sorry about that. Immune cells release enzymes like plaque 2 and MPO to destroy the plaque. Foam cells and fatty streaks are also produced. Again, more of this immune inflammatory reaction. Both of these are inflammatory. Cytokines, cyto meaning cell, kind meaning attractant. A cytokine is something released by these immune cells that attracts other immune cells. So as you see, you start getting into this increasing spiral of increasing inflammation. Cytokines are released and they drive inflammation in the area. Over time, soft plaques can then rupture like a pimple. You remember we've talked about Tim Russert, Big Russ, many times with his heart attack. What they described on his PATH report, his autopsy report, they said, once we sliced open his arteries, the insides of his arteries looked like the pimply face of a teenager with a really bad case of acne. He had these things all over. And if you're still having a problem understanding what inflammation looks like on the inside, I just did a couple of videos about three or four weeks ago talking about, at that point I had a lot of inflammation on my face from chemical I was using for precancerous growths. We showed the Two-Face, the Tommy Lee Jones villain in Batman. We showed Kim Kardashian. She has psoriasis. Some of these well-known celebrities that have either psoriasis or lupus or other things that can cause inflammation on the face. Once we see that on the face, we say, oh yeah, that's inflammation. It's the immune cells attacking stuff. Sometimes though, it's just hard to imagine that happening in the artery walls. That's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what's killing us. If the cap breaks off on these pimply faced or these pimples inside the artery, the soft plaque can rupture. It releases enzymes that forms a blood clot. Undissolved clots break off and get pushed into the smaller vessels large clots stop blood flow and block the oxygen supply. If the oxygen starved tissue is in the heart, the result's a heart attack. If the oxygen starved tissue is in the brain, the result is a stroke. If it's multiple little ones and it's in the back of the eyeball, that's when you get diabetic injury of the eye. You can also get decades of this microscopic levels and that can cause dementia in the brain or heart failure in the heart. Now, how do we detect inflammation? There's a longer story there. C-reactive protein is what Paul Ridker used. It's what most people use who actually look at this. But there's a problem with that. Common false positive rates. If we take 100 people today and give them a flu shot, the regular flu shot, two days later, 48 hours later, 66 of those 100 people will have a positive C-reactive protein. So as you can see, C-reactive protein, it's made by the liver, it's a response to any type of inflammation, and there's a lot of false positives. It's not just inflammation in the cardiovascular system. Now, microalbumin creatinine ratio, we also look at that because it's okay to use C-reactive protein, just one somewhat challenged indicator when you're doing global studies like Paul Ridker. But if we're looking at one patient, an N of one, one patient at a time, and we don't want to miss this, we need to use other tests to get a little bit better picture. Well, microalbumin creatinine ratio, it's a great option as well. We add that in our inflammation panel. If the intima in the kidney filters is damaged, so here, let me go back. Each kidney is about a million filters with some concentration ducts following those filters. The filter membrane in each of those million filters is the intima. What's usually the lining in the rest of the artery, the arterial trees, the arterial system. In fact, the filter is nothing but arteries that pass through the kidney, the media, that muscle layer backs away. You've got nothing but the intima. Now that's what the filter is, each of those million filters in the kidney. Now, if you're leaking protein into the urine in that filter, guess what? You're also leaking LDL from the blood into the artery wall in the rest of your arterial system. That's why we look at microalbumin creatinine ratio. The creatinine ratio is only there to help us understand how much and quantify the albumin is itself. So if albumin is leaking into the urine, LDL is likely leaking into the arterial wall. Now let's talk about plaque two. It's plaque two and MPO are both things that we typically look at on our inflammation panel. Sometimes they add IL-6. Most of the time they don't have access to it. 
but we get the picture with these four c-reactive protein microbiome and creatinine ratio plaque lp pla2 or plaque 2 and mpo now most people begin to think well that plaque 2 that must have to do with testing the plaque itself or maybe it's the platelets it's neither one you remember we mentioned that foam cells macrocytes create an enzyme and that enzyme is set up to start what it does is it starts dissolving the plaque that's plaque too we're actually measuring that enzyme in the bloodstream mpo is the same thing except it's not made by foam cells it's made by the neutrophils we can actually measure those in fact if you look in this picture you'll see you start to get plaque 2 and mpo development right here in this stage this is an artery normal starting to get plaque increased plaque starting to get some inflammation here and here's a little connect the dots kind of thing you notice these little green dots it's kind of gross if you get grossed out easily and you don't want to hear it close your ears for a second but you see these green dots so myelo peroxidase is actually has a color to it the color is green in fact if you go back you've probably seen it you may have some gross memories of it because the place you might have seen it would be mucus Sometimes if you have a bad cold or if a child has a bad cold, sometimes there's a greenish tint to the mucus, the snot. Well, that greenish tint comes from myeloperoxidase. The immune cells, the neutrophils are very active in that cold. They're releasing a lot of MPO and that's what's creating that greenish tint. I'm not gonna go into detail on IL-6. It's interleukin-6, it's a protein produced by various cells it's nearly always elevated when we do get cardiovascular inflammation. What causes inflammation? At least 80% of it's caused by diabetes or prediabetes. And I have to tell you, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Doc, I don't have diabetes. I don't have prediabetes. I know what I'm talking about. My doc checks it each, every six months and I check after him. I mean, I get that quote a lot. In fact, I have to take a break and do a little digression because I wanna share with you a slide from a patient that saw me just two weeks ago. My doc says I've got no sugar problems. I've checked, I'm watching him, he's right. And here's what they had. This patient had a hemoglobin A1C of 5.2. They had a fasting glucose about 90. That's perfect. The doc kept saying, you're in great shape. But they said, okay, doc, I know you're crazy about this. So I'll humor you, I'll take your studies. Here's what happened when we challenged that person's metabolism. Sure, the hemoglobin A1C came out in the low fives. It looked great. The fasting specimen, as you see here, was 94. They peaked at one hour at 168, and two hours was 124. Now, what's good, what's appropriate? Optimum would be 90, 120, and 100 or less. So this person clearly had prediabetes, moderate level. But here's the rest of the story. How do you control, how does your body keep your glucose down? It does it with insulin. We also measured insulin, and here's what we saw. Optimum levels for insulin would be five or less for basal or fasting insulin, 50 or less for peak, the one hour peak and 20 to 30 or less for the two hour peak. Here's what this individual's insulin levels were. In order to keep his basal glucose at 94, he was producing three times the optimum level, almost 15 insulin, six times the optimal level at the one hour peak. Optimum is 50, they were almost at 300. That's how much it was requiring to keep that level just as low as 168. And then at two hour, instead of down to 20, he was still up at 240. So almost what, 10 times the amount of insulin from optimal. So again, and this is from somebody who had quote, absolutely perfect numbers. You gotta stress it, you cannot just look at fasting numbers and say somebody's okay. And that's part of the point where studies have been done. Doctors don't know how to test for this. Buyer beware. It's your own health we're talking about here. If you depend on your doctor to know this stuff, it's not gonna work. You're gonna end up with all these other folks having heart attacks, strokes, and dementia. 
So I'm sorry. Thank you for tolerating the bunny hole. So uh, back to the script. In 2017, the CDC said that there are over 84 million adults in the U.S. with prediabetes. However, 90% of these people don't know they're prediabetic. The year before, the UCLA had already reported that, no, it wasn't one in three adults. It was over one in two adults, 55%. And here's the other thing. They also said, no, this doesn't start at age 60. We're talking about age 30 and above. Even for 30 year olds, one in three already have this problem. So can we delay this? I mean, am I just being a scaremonger, a fear monger? Am I just saying rooms burning, the sky's falling in? No, I hate people that do that, negative people. Here's why I'm continuing to cover this. There's a giant opportunity here. We can slow this down, stave this off and save ourselves decades of healthy life. We do not have to be this concept that you get in your 60s and a heart attack or a stroke can happen and kill you like a, like lightning out of the blue. That does not happen. You know, look it up, Harvard Health. It's not lightning out of the blue. It's, it's sort of like real lightning. This concept of lightning out of the blue is a movie concept. Lightning doesn't happen out of clear blue sky. Lightning happens when you've got a storm and we can find that metabolic storm and guess what it is it's inflammation you know we've known about this i'm not telling most of you something you didn't know time magazine on the cover in 2004 said this the secret killer the surprising link between inflammation heart attacks cancer alzheimer's and other diseases and here's the promise right below that and it's the promise i have too what you can do to fight it. Now, there's been a lot of stuff about the Campbells and their China study, the China study, and you might wonder, well, Brewer, you're big into low carb diet. Why are you presenting that? Because the China study really talked about plant-based diet. They attributed all of what they saw to plant-based diets. Here's what the issue was. Yes, you did see significant health. You did see 50,000 Chinese field workers up to 80 years of age with no plaque or inflammation. Yeah, they may have been eating mostly plants, but here's the thing. Obesity was not a big issue for these folks. So if we maintain our body fat, I would say, and those of you who are very emotional into the dietary battles, I would say body fat content, body fat percentage is at least as important, probably a little bit more important than macronutrients, whether it's carbs or whatever. Now on a day-to-day -day basis, clearly the most important thing is not eating carbs, but on a long-term basis, you got to get that body fat down because that drives this process. Atherosclerosis is not aged. Well, it is age dependent. You know where this argument's going. It's very lifestyle dependent though. What affects the amount of inflammation in our arteries and the amount of plaque, which leads to plaque rupture and ultimately in heart attacks or stroke. It's in what we eat, how active we are, our level of stress, you remember we started off talking about Thanksgiving and finding something to feel gratitude for. And the fact that that's not just airy fairy kind of junk, that's reality because it actually comes back to stress and cortisol levels. Continue to get great feedback regarding the webinars and here's why. You know, on the internet, when you hear a webinar, you expect for somebody to try to sell you something. We're not doing that. We're trying to tell you something. People are coming in with their labs from Quest, Inflammation Panel, OGTT, Insulin Survey Response, and then they're finding out, do I have inflammation? Do I have insulin resistance? And where does that fit in terms of other folks? We're getting ready to start one for CIMT as well. So again, people are really excited about finding out their own status. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks.